Well, good afternoon. If you are in the United States or Canada, I always want to shout out to my Canadian friends because Canada, wonderful country, is number 10 in the world in terms of coffee consumption. And that will be a theme today. Uh, my friends in Finland, you are number one for coffee consumption. My friends all over Scandinavia and in Luxembourg, big coffee drinkers. People drink coffee all over the world. And good evening to you in Europe, and especially in Torino, Turin, in Italy, where my guest is Giuseppe Lavazza. If you know the name Lavazza Coffee, it's the same family. He is the vice chair of the Lavazza Group a friend of mine for many, many years. And now I have to make a confession. I know that a lot of you think of me as a music guy, and I am, and an Italy guy, and an arts guy, and a cook, and you name it, I do it. However, passion number one is and always has been coffee. And I am I'm considered a coffee master. I've studied it endlessly. It is really one of my great passions. And this is not an advertisement for Lavazza, but Lavazza is one of the brands that I have always consumed among several. It is a magnificent company with a great heritage and Lavazza Coffee, Lavazza the company, but also Giuseppe Lavazza, my friend, has always been very deeply involved in the arts and especially music. So part of what we're going to explore today is this important link between coffee and culture, and especially how Lavazza and especially Giuseppe Lavazza makes the two things work together. So Giuseppe, benvenuto, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Fred. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to see you after a while, my, <laughs> my dear friend. How many cups of coffee have you had today? <laughs> you know, uh, we say that not less than three and no more than 33. So okay. in the between, <laughs> everything is fine. But so far, maybe oh, today was a pretty busy day. So I, I had already six, seven cups. Well, we're talking uh, about concentrating espresso. in the morning time. In the we're afternoon. talking about espressos. In Northern Europe, people drink bigger cups. And I... I make something called a cafe latte freddo, which is from Rome. <laughs> and did. this is quite a large dose of cafe latte freddo. And it's Lavazza coffee today, 100% in your honor. And what I do is I brew the coffee. I make it as an espresso. I chill it. And then I put it in this bottle and add fresh cold milk. And it's my favorite drink. It just is, there's nothing better than a cafe latte freddo. And I drink it throughout the day. That, and I've been great. drinking coffee since I'm a small child. Coffee is one of the very first fragrances that I knew. And to be very technical, when we talk about children and the acquisition of their senses, the first one that comes even before sight and hearing is the sense of smell. And the child knows its mother from her particular sense of her smell. And so children connect to the world much the way puppies do dogs in smell and in fragrance and so on and I come from a coffee drinking family and I knew that smell it was present in my house from my infancy and you're from Piemonte and I know that in Piemonte there's a tradition that when a baby is born the father dips his finger into some good red wine and then sticks it in the baby's mouth <laughs> they did not do that for me but I'm pretty sure they did that with coffee <laughs> that is my relationship with coffee. And so for that reason, I, I want to start with describe the sensorial feelings. The, when you think about coffee, and you've had many cups and I'm going to drink with you today. Um, what is it like? What sensations do you get? First of all, uh, I want to send you, uh, because knowing that you like uh, this uh, cold uh, uh, cafe latte, I wanted to send you um, a cold brew machine. You can prepare oh. cold brew coffee at, at home. Uh, and if you like this kind of uh, cold coffee drinks, uh, preparing uh, them with uh, um, a cold brew machine, it is very easy to be used. Uh, you can prepare your coffee overnight and then enjoy it uh, the day after. 
the flavor you get out is much better because you don't need to cool down the coffee when it's ready. So you don't need to heat the coffee and then to cool it down and maybe can affect a little bit uh, the final taste of your coffee and you get something very, very fresh and uh, very flavor. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful way of, of putting together the milk and your coffee and having, I think, uh, another kind of experience and uh, enjoying more and more uh, this kind of, uh, of coffee style that is, is it's, very, uh, it's very intriguing. And for, uh, from my point of view at coffee, it's, it's like wine. Uh, it's a very complex beverage. And when, uh, um, when I like uh, in the coffee, it's really uh, the core of the taste. So um, my sensation is really to, uh, to feel the drop and not to feel uh, the cup and the liquid and the water. Uh, so I'm very addicted to small and uh, Ristretto espresso is my favorite way of drinking coffee. I'm not a, a big fan of cappuccino and latte. Uh, so I'm really looking for the essence, the core, uh, um, the, um, the intense uh, intensity of, uh, of the, uh, the espresso. And uh, uh, I like to have it in, a, in a, just a, in a one sip and not to, to, to spend a lot of times drinking and drinking. And I prefer to have more cups during the day than just the one long, long, you know, um, consumption that maybe can last for, uh, for, for many, many minutes. So the temperature for me is essential. Uh, the intensity, the roundness of the espresso, the complexity of the taste, the elegance in the same time. I'm looking for uh, the mild style of the coffee. I don't like, for example, uh, 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 bold uh, cups, uh, uh, French roast, uh, or uh, for example, this kind of exaggeration in, in trying to announce too much uh, uh, the flavor of the coffee. I really like to approach the coffee uh, as for example, I can approach uh, food respecting quite a lot the raw material. Uh, or like, for example, a winemaker respect uh, 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 the naturality of, of the grapes uh, without trying to add in uh, something artificially, but really looking to extract from the coffee, it's a, it's a real nature. So if, for example, I try um, um, a natural uh, Brazilian coffee or a natural African coffee coming from uh, Ethiopia, I really like to uh, respect uh, all the beauty and, and, and of course all the bads that I can find in the cup because it's an expression of a, a particular piece of land, a territory, maybe a farmer or a way of farming. So I really like to find into, into my cup a little bit of traceability that really uh, carry me towards the origin. And it's a little bit, you know, uh, a little bit of escapism maybe when, when I, I, I try my coffee, but I really want to have this, uh, this, this, uh, this sensation, this connection with, with the origin countries and with particular areas. And so for me, for example, processing coffee is really to respect all of the complexity, all of the, the feature that this specific origin can, can provide to you. So even in, in, in the company, we try to do that. So we use, of course, many kinds of coffee. We are mastering blending. Uh, our specialization is in blending coffee, but we also have a lot of origins. But really what we're looking for is uh, the roundness, uh, the elegance, uh, and the sweetness. Uh, and you never find uh, a Lavazza blend that is characterized uh, from uh, you know, sharp taste uh, or... Uh, of something that is not balanced. Uh, it's like a beautiful music, to be a real good uh, harmony inside the different elements to create uh, a wonderful bouquet you can recognize uh, at the same time enjoy quite easily. And I wanna point out when you say sweetness that we're not talking about the addition of sugar, but the sweetness that exists in the coffee itself. That's very important. Um, 
you know, Giuseppe, I want to say first to listeners, everything that Giuseppe just described about his relationship, his sensorial relationship to a cup of coffee, we could also say about music. And when you go back and watch this conversation again, listen to everything he just said and remove yourself from coffee and put it in music or any kind of art. And you'll discover that the the way we respond is really the same, which is a fascinating thing. Uh, I'm not what's called a foodie. I don't like that word. I'm not someone who believes in being trendy. So if this particular brand or this particular preparation is fashionable this year, that that's what we want. I'm someone who believes in classicism and study. And Giuseppe, you know that I teach coffee all over the world as a subject, and I've lectured on it, and I've traveled to places where coffee is grown. And so what I'm going to do now, not for you, because you know this stuff, but for our listeners, is do maybe a three or four or five minute uh, distillation, an espresso version of my coffee talk, because to me, coffee is a miracle in that um, it's kind of like the salmon that go out to sea and spawn and come back and they have a life cycle. Coffee has a life cycle and one cup of espresso is made from 50 beans and not 49 and not 51, but 50 beans. And these beans can come from anywhere in the world where coffee is grown, of course. So it could be parts of Africa. It's equatorial. Brazil, Colombia, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Central America, the Caribbean, all of those places produce beautiful coffee, but it's not all the same coffee. Even though the genetic roots may be the same, and it's called cofea is the root, and it goes back to Ethiopia, Eastern Africa, probably from a place called Kaffa, K-A-F-F-A, and but the plant spread all over the world. I always tell people to think about the fact that it's from Ethiopia where we believe the oldest humans are from. So the relationship between man and woman, in other words, the human race, and coffee goes back to the very beginnings of time and, and origin. And coffee, like human being, spread all over the world and adapted. It spread all over the world for different reasons than did human beings. And we'll get back to that in a moment. But go back to the 50 beans. If those 50 beans may be harvested in Brazil, let's say pick four countries, Brazil, Colombia, Ethiopia, and Indonesia. And all those beans arrive at the port, I believe of Genoa or Savona that serves Lavazza because Lavazza, unlike most coffee companies is not in a port. It's inland in Torino. And therefore, it's, the beans are transported from all over the world to the port of Genoa, and then they're taken by land to Torino. And if one of the beans, only one of the 50 beans is spoiled or has mold or whatever, the coffee is ruined. The whole bag is ruined. So already it has to be a miracle that they arrive in good shape. Then the company that receives them has to inspect the beans um, combine them in what you call the blend. So let's say I'm saying approximately it will be 20 Brazilian beans and 10 Colombian beans and 18 Ethiopian beans and the rest from Indonesia, whatever you want. Um, every single company in Italy has its own blends. And there are seven, last time I checked, 700 different coffee companies in Italy, of which Lavazza is the biggest, but there are many. And I love going around Italy, going to small, they're called Torre Fazioni, places where coffee is selected and roasted and sold. And you can go to little towns all over Italy and people in that town will only drink or primarily drink the blend of the town, plus the big brands such as Kimbo and Ilya and Lavazza and a few others, Hausbrand. And so therefore, once the coffee is roasted because the beans arrive and they're green, uh, then how you roast it changes the flavor. How you store the beans, how they are either ground or sold whole, but then what kind of grinder someone has at home or in an Italian bar. Then the water that's used, the machine that's used, 
the pressure in the machine, the temperature of the water, as you said, how much does the water have um, calcium and other elements in it? The water in Naples is very different from the water in Turin. And Neapolitans say that they have the best coffee. People in Turin and Trieste and various places say that they have the best coffee. I don't make such assertions. I like going around from place to place. But if the barista, the person making the coffee, does something wrong, even if the beans were perfect, the coffee is no good. If the cup is filled too high, too low, if the cup is not the proper temperature, which is usually 35 to 40 degrees Celsius or 94 to 104 Fahrenheit, if any of those elements is off, you don't have a perfect cup of coffee. And that's why to me, it is a miracle when it arrives that way. And people don't necessarily appreciate all that goes into it. And the other thing, Giuseppe, that's very different from wine. Uh, I've written a lot about wine. I once won a big award for my wine writing and so on. And I always get my wine friends upset when I say, if I had to choose between coffee and wine, without a doubt, I would pick coffee. And they always say wine. Wine is produced usually behind the house of the winemaker. And he or she grows the grapes and follows the grapes and makes sure that everything is of quality and decides when the grapes should be picked and how <coughs> they should be vinified into wine. That is entirely different than relying on farmers and growers all around the world to produce coffee that then arrives in Torino or Genoa or wherever and has to be turned into coffee. It's there, we cannot make equivalency between coffee and wine. I love them both, but coffee just to me is a miraculous product. And your company, did I leave anything out? I guess I did, but <laughs> it's a pretty good synthesis for people who don't understand what's in their cup of coffee. You are a perfect coffee sapiens, uh, <laughs> uh, Fred, uh, yeah. Perfect. Really, you know the you know uh, the topic very very well. Congratulations, you're a true expert. And yes, uh, the complexity of the coffee supply chain is uh, terrific. And 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 people that don't understand because they don't know, of course, they're not aware how long is the journey of a coffee bean from from the field to to the cup and and and. Uh, how is uh, complicated as well to sort out uh, the kind of coffee you like. So the selection, the, procure, the procurement, the buying, uh, all the process of the coffee and get in the, in the origin country is, it, it's, it, it's crucial, it's paramount, uh, um, especially for companies as Lavazza that rely only on, on this kind of, of raw material. And if you think about, yeah, you're right. So the coffee is an equatorial product. So it's produced all around the, the world uh, on the equatorial belt. And the coffee production is, is huge, it's immense. And we are talking about uh, more than uh, 170 million of coffee bags. Uh, each bag uh, weighed more or less 60 kilos. So it's, it's, a, it's a continent of coffee. And, and when, when the journey starts, uh, we are talking about uh, 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 a, a bulk, so really an uh, indistinctive uh, uh, mass of coffee that uh, uh, step uh, after step uh, um, is introduced in a sort of funnel and, 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 and arrive, for example, to, uh, to a company as Lavazza, uh, really uh, passing through a lot of incredible selection stages. And, and we really have to pick up just a, a tiny a fraction of the quantity of the, the total production and exactly the kind of coffee we need for, a, for example, of a blend that focus on, on keeping the, consist the consistency of the taste of the coffee over the years. It's a different, of course, approach uh, respect to the origins where we accept uh, of course, the fluctuation, but in the same time, uh, we're looking for uh, exceptional taste uh, or, or very, you know, sophisticated and, and, and fancy uh, uh, type of consumption. So, uh, and, and, and fraction of, of quantity as well, because sometimes uh, with specialty coffee, we're talking about a batch of uh, 
10 bags or uh, 20 bags, really tiny quantity respect to the quantity that a company as Lavazza, it, it, it's moving every, every year. So it's an incredible journey, very complicated, and we need uh, each stage to push for education. We need to have good farmers, so we need to have a wealthy and, and, and nice uh, uh, coffee supply chain starting from the origin, of course. So the farmers and then the traders uh, and then the shippers uh, and then of course uh, the roasting companies and then the customers and then the baristas and then of course uh, the coffee lovers and the final consumers. And each stage need of course to be uh, approached in a right way, introducing a lot of uh, education, especially nowadays, uh, where we are, you know, we are very sensible to uh, big, 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 big challenges, the climate change, the sustainability and, and the circular economy and all, of course, the big, big, you know, um, topics that are uh, so important in uh, agricultural commodity as coffee is. So education, 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 control, and as I said, everyone in the supply chain take a responsibility to uh, execute uh, and optimize all the processing. So a final uh, mistake can really waste an incredible job uh, involving um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and, and because coffee is it's, it's a global, of course, uh, product, of course, the risk of uh, incurring this kind of mistakes is very high. So for a company as Lavazza to try, of course, to offer um, a, a very sound net to avoid this kind of, uh, of situation, it's, uh, it's part of our, our, our daily job. It's uh, as important as pro procurement, as buying, for example, the best coffee we can buy or roasting in the best way and uh, giving our assistance to the baristas and of course provided to our customer all the information they need to optimize uh, all the single detail uh, is absolutely relevant. But there's a difference I just realized between coffee and music in that if someone is playing the piano and he hits or she hits a wrong note, it doesn't ruin the entire piece. But if a single error is made in the whole life cycle from the 50 beans that are berries to the cup, at your home or in your office or at the bar, it's ruined. And it's, a, it's kind of like being an acrobat walking on the high wire. And if you lose your balance, you've lost your balance, that's it, and off you go, unless you grab the wire again and pull up. But that's not a good thing for a cup of coffee. Now, it's not that perfection can be had every time. Um, I wanna add more to the topic of coffee because I know that I'm asked all the time and there's so much, misinformation about coffee that I want to set certain things straight. The crop, the plant developed in East Africa, probably around Ethiopia. Um, there are basically two general varieties, Cafea Cofea Arabica and Cofea Canefora, which is we also call Robusta. From that, there are many varieties that one can have, but these are the two types. I would generically say generically that the Arabica is more wine-like and the Robusta is a little more uh, substantial, Robusta, robust. Um, it has a slight woody taste to it, which is not a bad thing necessarily. And the way different Arabica beans and different Robusta beans are combined results in the final cup, in the blend that every single coffee producer has as part of their heritage. And the Robusta forms something when an espresso is made called the crema, that little orange foam that appears on the top of the cup. Uh, the crema is a desirable thing, but what a lot of people don't know is that when you receive the cup and receive a little spoon with it, immediately stir it because the sugars, the natural sugars are mostly in the crema. So if you drink it and you get, you don't have a mustache, but if you have a mustache, if you get that little orange crema on your mustache or on your lip in your case, um, what you're doing is you're putting the sugars on your lip if you stir it. 
the coffee, the final product acquires its own sweetness. Now from Ethiopia, as merchants and travelers in the ancient world went to different directions, the next important place where coffee arrived was Yemen, which now is a very tragic place for all the ongoing humanitarian crisis. But at that time, it was a crossroads on the Arabian Peninsula. And it was there that Arabica was first uh, defined. And it was there that roasting of coffee beans first happened. And because it's a crossroads, it meant that coffee went to Indonesia and India and parts east in Asia. Many people don't think of coffee being in Asia. They think of tea. And of course, tea is in Asia, but coffee is a very present thing in Asia. It went into Turkey, into the Ottoman Empire, let's call it then, and Constantinople, now Istanbul, where cafes, where shops open, where people drank coffee. Being a Muslim society where they did not drink alcohol, this was the libation that you had in bars. And the Turks invented equipment that made a rather intense cup of coffee with the grounds in it. It traveled to Greece and then it got to Venice. And Venice then began to share it all over Italy and other parts of Europe. And what's very important to know is every country that was a colonial country received coffee from Venice and elsewhere. Uh, so Portugal, Spain, France, Holland, and the United Kingdom, Great Britain, primarily. Italy was not so colonial, but Italy was the place of transformation and in my view, making things better. And so what we had was that the British, when they acquired Jamaica, when they acquired other parts of the Caribbean, brought the coffee plant from the gardens, from Kew Gardens in London to these colonies. When the Spanish colonized much of the Americas, they brought coffee to places like Colombia and Costa Rica and many more. The Portuguese, of course, brought coffee to Brazil. That's the biggest producer. The Dutch traded instead with East India, with Indonesia, but also brought coffee to a few of their islands. And the French, similarly, in West Africa, the French have a taste for more robusta. And a lot of the robusta they produce and consume is in West Africa, but also places such as Haiti, uh, Guadeloupe, Martinique, and so on. And therefore, the crop is African, the original plant, but it's mostly produced outside of Africa. And it's one of the many products in the world that was not born in a place, but does better in a place. Chocolate, which is coffee's cousin, uh, was born in Mexico, but most of the fine chocolate now grows either in small amounts in Ecuador and Venezuela, but especially the Ivory Coast and Ghana and parts of West Africa. So bananas, for example, are from uh, Africa and Southern Europe but now they mostly grow in the Americas. So there are endless products like that and coffee became part of that. Coffee is the global food or food product, I would say. I cannot think of another product that travels so much. There are many products such as fruit that are grown locally in vegetables and milk and meat and so on that tend to be produced and consumed closer to where it's made. But coffee, as we discussed, comes from every corner of the equatorial world and goes to the poles, goes to the north and the south, because people where it's darker and colder drink more coffee and it keeps them awake. So coffee has also uh, nourished many musicians, that I know. Um, Giuseppe provided a beautiful list of his recommendations my Dodger, we'll get to that later. But I added a couple of things. Bach wrote a coffee cantata because Bach wrote more than 450 cantatas and a phenomenal amount of music. And he wrote this cantata as a tribute to coffee about how he kept his energy to keep going. And my colleague Hugo Shirley at Idacho has produced an afternoon coffee listening program that includes a lot of coffee related pieces. So Giuseppe, I wanna go back to something else, Torino, Turin, your hometown, your family is from there. And there was an original Giuseppe Lavazza who in 1895 
opened what was called a drogeria, a dry goods store. And that's a very Italian concept where uh, what would be sold in a drogeria? This was on Via San Tommaso. Yeah. Drogeria is a little um, a grocery store. It was uh, the dream of my great grandfather, Luigi. Uh, he was born uh, in a small uh, village, uh, uh, 40 kilometers far away from Turin, and uh, living in the countryside. But because of uh, climate change, uh, because of adverse uh, climate conditions, uh, problem with, uh, with the harvest, uh, he was forced to move to city to find, uh, uh, find a job and, uh, and to make uh, his living. So was pretty young uh, with a lot of dreams. Uh, of course, uh, he, he dreamed to become uh, an entrepreneur. And he started working uh, in different companies, small companies, and even in some uh, grocery stores. And uh, he fell in love with this kind of job in love to, for example, to, uh, uh, to interact with, uh, with commodities with with this kind of products and uh, even also to manufacture to to to, to craft uh, the products himself uh, uh, at one point of his life uh, in, he found a man that trust uh, in uh, uh, his dreams uh, he got a loan from uh, this gentleman uh, and uh, invested every single lira at that time that was the, the currency uh, buying uh, a, a small shop in Via San Tommaso, a small, it was abandoned, a small shop. But Turin at the time, we're talking about uh, 1895, uh, and you have to remember that uh, the unification of uh, the country happened just a few years before in 1861, and Turin was the capital. And the capital after, but, but unfortunately after two, three years, uh, the capital was moved towards Florence and then to Rome. So Turin, lost a very important position, political and of course, uh, social in, uh, in uh, the Italian geography. So the, the city was uh, really facing a big transformation from a political center towards an industrial center. We had at the time in town uh, um, uh, a very strong uh, um, aristocracy that was very rich at the time, very international, and very willing to invest money in new technology, exactly as happen, is happening now with the digital transformation. And the time was the mechanical transformation. So it was the first years of uh, the appearance of uh, cars, for example. And in fact, uh, that was the year when the Fiat company, pretty famous some years ago, Italian car manufacturer was founded by <clears throat> by a group of uh, aristocrats uh, that wanted to, to start uh, the kind of job. So, uh, the, now, the does city... that stand for Fabbrica Italiana Automobilistica di Torino? Yeah, it stands exactly from, uh, for uh, this uh, uh, translation. Uh, so, yes, uh, it's Italian. You may not know that in America, when we had some Fiats in the 1960s and you couldn't get parts, everyone said that Fiat stood for Fix It Again, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but in Brazilian there is another joke, of course, uh, is Fabrica Italiana Trapagliamento Trafico, that stands for uh, uh, creating traffic jam. So more or less, you know, the company was <laughs> pretty famous in globally speaking for the same stuff. But uh, okay, in the country was a big revolution, and I remember in uh, the 50s, in the 60s, the launch of the Fiat 500 was a uh, Quite a legendary car, very small for a, for a household. It was a big revolution for the country. But uh, the, the company was founded in, in, in this period of time. So Turin was a pretty uh, vibrant uh, industrial city. And that city hosted in the same time one of the most important international exposition in, uh, in uh, 1911. So it was, was were really a growing city. And, and the idea of opening a grocery store selling coffee and many other products downtown was a good idea. And the coffee and, and the store and the business uh, was very successful. So Luigi Lavazza uh, took a very good decision to do that. 
Okay, and, and during this first period of time, uh, he, he fell in love with coffee. He was really attracted by this new kind of, uh, of product, exotic, interesting, uh, requested by the best uh, bars and, and coffee shop. Uh, Turin was very famous, and it is still very famous for uh, its uh, historical and traditional coffee shops. And in the coffee shop, especially in Italy, but not only in Italy, in France, in many other European countries, the big revolution that transformed the face of uh, the political geography of, of, of the Europe itself uh, uh, um, really um, laid down their foundation. And, and what, there were the place where the intellectuals and politicians and, and, uh, and um, um, the revolutionaries uh, were gathered to uh, to share their ideas and to prepare uh, the big revolution of the uh, 19th century. So, uh, thinking including about Giuseppe Verdi. Verdi. Yes, of course, exactly. Was a big part that, of that, yeah. Yes, but in France, I think about, for example, the Illuminism that was really the part of the transformation of the European mindset, preparing all the revolution and all the, 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 the deep social changes. So, was. Uh, Coffee was very important because it was part of this new um, urban environment. The big city became the center of the big transformation, and the coffee shop and the coffee took a big part in this uh, in this uh, in this revolution in this big transformation of society itself. So, it was a good idea. Luigi Lavazza fell in love with the coffee and started to thinking about how to. Uh, creating something new. So uh, he's considered the, 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 the pioneer of blending because with blending, he wanted to create its own products and to uh, uh, um, position in the product itself, uh, to make a distinction towards all the other products. Uh, so he invested quite a lot of ideas, time, even money, buying uh, uh, one of his first uh, full uh, automatic machine for roasting coffee in 1923. So what a pretty, you know, clever guy and, and, and ready to invest and, and, and to trust in uh, his own ideas. The business grew pretty well. So the second generation stepped into the company and then the first uh, uh, were world arrived and then the second, uh, but the business- uh, well, I'm gonna slow you down there because there's important things to go back at the beginnings. Yeah. Um, Via San Tommaso is walking distance from the Teatro Reggio, which is the opera house in Turin, Torino. Yes. And uh, the wonderful square there has porticos and cafes and bakeries, because what you did not say, because you're slim, you're a, a good shaped man, um, is the magnificent cake in Torino. <laughs> that is just some of the best baking in the world. And the chocolates, in Torino are the best in Italy. And the chocolate bar that we know was invented very close to Via San Tommaso and vermouth as a beverage and the cocktail tradition. And all of that came from this neighborhood between the Tatra Reggio and the Via San Tommaso in the, right in the center. And in the 1890s, when Luigi was setting up his shop, Giacomo Puccini lived in Torino and his first great successful operas, Manon Lascaux in 1893 and La Boheme, the most famous opera of all in 1896, premiered in Torino in the Teatro Reggio. And I would like to think that Puccini went into the Lavazza shop and bought some coffee. Do you have any evidence of that? He drank a great deal of coffee. I know that for a fact. Is no. there any way of knowing if he, he, it's very possible? It's very possible. Yes, it's very possible because, uh, as, as you said, uh, Teatro Radio is just uh, 200, uh, yeah, 200 meters far away from uh, this uh, uh, small street downtown the city. Yes, and, 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 and downtown was really the epicenter of the cultural and, and industrial and business life uh, of, of, of the city. So... Yes, absolutely. And, and Turin was a pretty important uh, cultural center in Italy. It was 
was relevant because of this social environment, because of this very wealthy uh, aristocratic class that, that live in, in town, that even a, 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 a bourgeois class was, was pretty, pretty strong, was a very rich city uh, at that period of time. So yes, absolutely, that is possible. But uh, another big musician crossed, I'm sure of that, uh, the path of my family uh, from my mother's side, because the family of my, my mother was um, uh, original from Venice, and, and they, they own and they still own the Cafe Quadri, uh, and the Cafe La Vena, sorry, the Cafe La Vena, yeah. sorry, the Cafe La Vena, and the Cafe La Vena was the place where Richard Wagner, Wagner, I know, yeah. yes, where used to go, used to go when uh, it was in Venice, uh, and and I'm very sure because there is uh, uh, still now a sort of uh, of uh, memorabilia of uh, uh, is uh, it, uh, attendance uh, in, in in the coffee shop and part of the Wagner family is still in in connection with uh, the, the the family of my mom. So. Uh, and 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 uh, and because of this, uh, I was able many years ago to have the uh, opportunity to go to Bayreuth to <laughs> attend uh, for a couple of seasons a uh, part of uh, the summer the summer Bavarian festival that you know uh, it, it is performed in in Bayreuth. So um, maybe in Turin, you're right. Puccini went to visit the shop and maybe uh, met my. Uh, great grandfather, maybe uh, he, he bought some coffee, but on the other side, so on the, the northeast side of Italy, in Venice, I'm sure that my, the family of my mom had a lot of connection with 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 um, Richard Wagner and after him, of course, with uh, his family. Well, that cafe in Venice, uh, obviously, is very well known. It's a wonderful cafe, and what's particular about it is it's on the sunny side of the piazza. Yes, correct. And the Italians did not want to go onto the sunny side. So the Italians went to Quadri on the shady side. Yes, and Florida. The Europeans, so the Norwegians would go there, the Germans, the Austrians, um, everybody from Northern Europe who wanted to sit in the sun in Venice would be in that cafe. And it's very particular for that reason because you don't really see Italians go into there even now because Italians don't want to be out in the sun, interestingly. Um, and the, as I mentioned just briefly, the coffee tradition in Venice is remarkable in a very different way. And Trieste, Trieste, even more than Venice, is a great part of the coffee tradition. And because Trieste was under Vienna from 1361 to 1918, what I didn't mention before is Vienna's love of coffee because the cafe tradition of Vienna and the cake in Vienna is like Torino. It's, it's a marvelous thing. We know exactly when coffee got to Vienna. It was in 1683, there was a siege in Vienna by the Turks, by the Ottomans, who were trying to conquer Vienna and they were pushed back at the walls of Vienna. And they left and they left their bags of coffee and they left phyllo dough, the, the strata of dough, the crunchy that you use in, in Turkish pastries, which are wonderful too. And the Viennese started putting apples inside the phyllo dough, and that's how strudel was born. And the Viennese figured out how to brew the coffee, and it evolved to this make this incredible cafe tradition in Vienna. So around the Vienna State Opera are wonderful cafes as there are throughout the city. The Zacher is right across the street, the Cafe Mozart, but wherever you go in Vienna, there's that. Um, coffee and music seem to sit right by one another very, very effectively. I wanna tell listeners that Giuseppe provided a very wonderful and mostly quite Germanic list of musical selections on Idaggio, including the entire ring cycle, Tristan and Isolde and Parsifal, so, yes, you are a convinced Wagnerian, as I am. Um, but also Mozart, Rachmaninoff, Sanson, Puccini's Bohème, uh, Callas, one little gesture toward the Italian repertory, Norma, conducted by Tullio Serafin. But 
you could drink a lot of coffee listening to Giuseppe's list, and I commend it to you. Um, going back now to the growth of technology in Turin, Torino. Um, I call it Torino. I don't know why other Italian cities, I will say Venice, I will say Trieste, I will say Rome or Florence or Naples. To me, it's not Turin, it's Torino. And so that's just my habit. Um, in the 1920s, as you mentioned, the technology in Torino helped produce the Eureka machine, which could roast 12 kilograms of coffee at one time. Therefore, your family began to decide to make decisions about coffee roasting. And I'm not asking you to reveal secrets because every roasting company has their own secrets and preferences. But this was a revolution in a way, this machine. It's kind of like when the sewing machine arrived and you no longer had to do everything with needle and thread, but you could use the sewing machine. These things move the world forward. The invention of machines to make coffee, make espresso, especially technology by Gadja from Torino and Milan, um, meant that the, there was a revolution in how coffee was produced. Before that, people made coffee in their homes, or you'd go to a cafe and they would make coffee in the cafe, but often by an infusion of water and, and coffee beans, ground coffee beans. I want to mention one more thing about our friend Puccini. Puccini was a famous Donaiolo ladies' man, and he particularly liked a cafe in Torino that was run by women called the Cafe Bicherin that was founded in the 18th century, I believe 1765, but I'm not certain. And he liked to go there because the women who ran it were very attractive and liked him. And they created a coffee drink, which is called the Bichirin, which is a combination of chocolate and coffee and cream and so on. And it's notable, it's delicious, but it's notable because somewhere in there, coffee went from being a pure beverage to an ingredient. And so now you see coffee appearing in many different guises. It's flavored and I don't like coffee where they've added butterscotch or you know banana or whatever that coconut, whatever they add. Um, I just like the coffee, but coffee is used as a flavoring. I use coffee a little bit in cooking, not too much, but in certain meats, it adds an interesting sub note. But um, so Torino became the place that was powered by coffee and by fiat by the company fiat i mean and um but torino also had and has a very important newspaper la stampa which in effect is the biographer of the city of torino it chronicles daily life it was always the newspaper that had more opinion and intellectual articles and torino is one of the main publishing centers of italy Inaudi and other publishing houses are in Torino, and therefore there's a huge book culture in Torino, and people read a lot in Torino. Um, it is a remarkably cultured city. I tell people who don't know it, don't expect it to be Milan or Florence or Rome or Naples or any of the other Italian cities. To me, it's more like Paris and Vienna than it is like an Italian city. It was an imperial city. It was a royal city because uh, the uh, ruling family of Italy and of the Italian uh, constitutional monarchy were from there. Um, it has big boulevards, not little streets like Florence or Bologna, um, but it has what I call the grande prospettiva, the long perspective. I'm from New York City. We have long avenues in New York and you can see to infinity. Turin is the only city in Italy that really has that. Paris has it to some degree with the Grand Boulevards. Vienna certainly has it. And so these royal cities with their cultural centers, with their artistic centers, with their big important theaters right in the middle, with their important newspapers um, became attractions. But the difference was Vienna and Paris ruled empires and Turin was more restrained and therefore could develop on its own, its own character, 
without being imitative of other cities. And it's a very special environment for that reason. It's surrounded by beautiful farmland and then mountains. You had the 2006 Winter Olympics. Um, I came to work in Turin during the Olympics to be sort of a, a cultural interpreter for uh, broadcasting in the United States. And it's a remarkable city. It's the only city I know that has a fruit museum. Have you been to the fruit museum? Yes. Yeah, it's a remarkable city. But first yeah. of all, it's, it's a Roman city. So this is why yes. it's so different from uh, the other medieval city that uh, are very well known for, uh, for uh, artistical beauties uh, and architecture all around, uh, all around Italy. Or of course, it's not Rome. It's uh, a sort of melting pot of different uh, ages uh, at something very unique in the world. But Turin was, first of all, um, a Roman city, so with this uh, orthogonal grid of streets, and with the main two streets, the like Cardo de Cumano, it was the main uh, main street that cross like across the city, and that was totally renewed by Napoleon during uh, the 19th century when the French arrived uh, and Napoleon decided to restructure the city and to rebuild uh, these big boulevards, exactly as in following uh, the pattern of, of, of Paris, the same. So building beautiful uh, bridges over uh, the River Po and, and building these big uh, avenues, large avenues that you remember so well. So it, it's, it's the story of Turin, it's totally different from the story of other cities. So, and you can feel it when you visit the city. It's a very elegant city, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, this is true, because we have an incredible number of uh, ancient palaces in, in Europe, Turin is the third city in Europe uh, uh, for the number of uh, ancient palaces after Paris and Budapest. So if you, for example, have a walk uh, downtown, you see beautiful palaces uh, coming from uh, uh, 17th, 18th century. Uh, and this is a part of this uh, large uh, aristocratic class uh, that's really uh, colonized uh, the city uh, uh, during uh, two centuries as a part of the uh, Savoy, Savoy um, uh, kingdom and, and Savoy family. And the relationship with France were also very, very strong. So we had a lot of influence coming from France uh, in, in, many, in many aspects of our social life. And this is maybe why chocolate is so important uh, uh, for, for the food uh, culture of Turin, because as you know, Chocolate was part uh, of, of uh, played a, a relevant part uh, in, in, in the court uh, of the king of France, uh, and especially the ladies around the king. And chocolate was considered really something very, very special and important uh, during the 18th century in France. And because uh, the Savoya family uh, was looking at France as a sort of, uh, you know, aspirational model, and being uh, a little bit much lower uh, 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 um, um, royal family, uh, they love to replicate uh, on a smaller scale uh, the, 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 the habits uh, and, and, and the fence uh, that uh, um, uh, the king of France uh, uh, love to introduce uh, in, in the court uh, in Paris and of course uh, in Versailles. But another, for example, uh, point of, 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 uh, of, um, of relationship uh, is the fact that uh, uh, Le Nôtre, the very famous uh, um, um, landscaping uh, architect uh, of uh, the Roi Soleil, the design, uh, um, the garden and the park of Versailles work uh, also in Turin uh, in the royal palace. So we have a lot of a uh, lot of connection between uh, France uh, and and this region, the Piemonte. And as you said, uh, it, it's it's a tiny region; it's not a big region, but full of everything because you can find uh, uh, a nice city as Turin, full of culture, full of art, uh, full of beautiful architecture. Is one of, uh, I think, uh, the part of the Baroque architecture. You, you can find, I think, the most beautiful architecture uh, building um, 
Baroque style, uh, because in the city work uh, architects as, for example, Yuvarra. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we have beautiful um, craftsmen that work uh, with wood. For example, we have Pifete, it's considered one of the most important ebonists in, in the world. So, and then all around, uh, beautiful hills and the Langa region and the mountains and the lakes uh, and the plain uh, with all the, uh, the rice field that are very, very nice as well. So a lot of, you know, uh, different nuances uh, uh, that create uh, a quite a unique uh, piece of land. I do want to point out to listeners that chocolate was a beverage. So when you talk about chocolate in the 18th century in France, it was a beverage to rival coffee. It was not a candy. It was not something that you ate. It became something you ate only when it was invented in Torino in 1846. And after that, chocolate as a candy evolved. It was seasonal because in warm weather, you could not have it. So it was something you looked forward to in the colder months but gradually chocolate began to stabilize. And that's a whole other story for another time. But I refer to coffee and chocolate as being cousins because they, they have similar trajectories and they uh, somehow more men drank coffee and women ate, drank chocolate at a time. Then it began to mix and then the flavors began to mix producing what's called mocha, which is a whole other thing unto itself. And then the addition of milk did additional things in terms of how we consume these products. And nowhere in all of this is, have I mentioned sugar, because I don't like sugar in the addition, in addition to coffee or chocolate or anything. I love the flavors as they are. And we have to unlearn the automatic addition of sugar. It used to be in Italy, uh, before certain hygienic laws were around, that you would have a big um, sort of sugar holder on a counter of a bar and the bartender would pick up a spoon and say quanti zuccheri and throw start throwing in coffee and i would always say stop niente zucchero and in naples they once said to me oh ma lo bevi amaro do you drink it bitter and i say no it's not bitter non è amaro è già dolce it's already sweet um, it's just, it's a habit thing. And you know, Giuseppe, that in America, when immigrants came to the United States from Italy and they couldn't afford good coffee, they would take a lemon peel and rub it on the cup or perhaps put it even into the cup just to neutralize the bad coffee. But I want to establish once and for always that in Italy, it is not customary to put lemon peel into coffee. It's just not done. Am I mistaken about that? Yeah, no, there no, may I, be a few places, but really it's, it's not done. No, but uh, yeah, uh, for example, in Naples, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, the, tr the tradition, uh, it's pretty standard that uh, the barista uh, put a sugar in your cup before uh, putting your cup on the counter. So it, it's, uh, you know, it's mandatory for them because it's very bitter. So if you don't want to, to have sugar in your cup, you have to to tell it to, to, the, to the barista before he, he, he brews the coffee for you. Otherwise, uh, it's too late and you have to pay another coffee. Uh, oh. Yeah, but <laughs> the, the, the coffee culture in Italy is so strong because, as you mentioned, uh, we invented a lot of stuff that created uh, um, uh, the fashion of coffee. And first of all, the coffee on demand because espresso means to stand for uh, something done on demand, espresso mean expressly made, so for you. And the first espresso machine- was That's important. So it's not fast. It's not like a fast train and an express train. It's expressly made for you. It yeah. is an expression of water through grounds, the coffee grounds at a certain temperature. Yeah. After yeah. 50 beans have been ground to a certain degree. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the fact that the process uh, it became so fast that it was connected to uh, a business need. So to prepare a lot of coffee and to serve a lot of people when uh, uh, er everyone arrived to have a coffee, for example, in, in the peak hours, uh, in the morning or after lunch or in the middle of the day. So it was more connected to um, 
the way of uh, of, of 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 coping with uh, uh, you know a, a big gathering of people that needs of course to have a coffee in in few in few minutes because as you know uh, Italians uh, love to step into a coffee shop and not to sit at the table to go straight right to the counter and to ask uh, and for for a um, their own espresso, everyone ordering uh, 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 his favorite or her favorite cup in a different way. And the barista have to work very quick to serve uh, 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 tens of people in the same time, sip the espresso in two, three minutes. And they have a talk, maybe they eat uh, a croissant or a, or a small cake, and then they go away. And the first uh, uh, machine uh, that was patented and invented with the idea of, of serving espresso on demand was invented in Turin in 1864 by Mr. Moriondo. That's the name of the inventor. In our Lavazza Museum, we have a copy, a replica of this incredible machine. It's a sort of big tank for a hot water. Pretty interesting, but not able to prepare the espresso as we know it today with the, with the foam. Uh, in 1901, uh, uh, Bezzera, uh, uh, engineer from Milan, uh, repatented the, uh, the, the first machine of Mr. Moriondo and created the first uh, uh, industrial produ production of, of the espresso machine. And it was the really uh, breakout of, of the espresso mania that started uh, um, colonizing uh, the peninsula at the beginning of the 20th, the 20th century. But the, the, the foam arrived only in 1848 with the, uh, with the, the Gaggia machine invented by another engineer from Milan, Mr. Gaggia, that uh, um, um, reinventing the way the espresso was produced, uh, creating this uh, uh, sort of uh, emulsion. So air with the coffee and with the hot water and this blend of three elements uh, had the chance of uh, providing you the legendary layer of foam uh, that transformed, of course, uh, the face uh, of the espresso. So the espresso, the as we know, the it, so-called yeah. crema. In American English, we actually say crema, not foam. We use the Italian word. The crema, the crema. Yeah. And at the same time was invented the cappuccino. And the story of the cappuccino is very nice because, of course, uh, we... Uh, the, 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 the machine were equipment with, uh, with, um, with the tool to create, uh, uh, to, to, to produce the steam, the wand. And, uh, and uh, for me, the story of cappuccino, it's, it's very intriguing because, uh, you know, it's, it's part of Italian creativity to transform something very poor and plain as uh, uh, coffee and milk uh, that before uh, the Second World War was considered maybe one of the main mean of the poor people. At uh, nighttime, many, many families, many people in Italy used to eat just milk and coffee and some bread. That was the meal, the night meal, the, the supper. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, uh, this idea of milk and coffee was connected to uh, the bad period before uh, the war and uh, with, 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 the, with the poverty, with, with a lot of troubles. Uh, so how to, sell again something like that uh, after the war during the Italian miracle uh, to people that were there to cheer, to enjoy the life, not to think about uh, the, the, the bad period that they had before and during the Second World War. And so the new version of the milk and coffee was the cappuccino. So an espresso coffee and of course a shot of milk, but not a simple milk. A steam milk, <laughs> something very fluffy, very nice, with a very good uh, texture and with a beautiful look. And this was, you know, the uh, the way they they revamp this idea of the milk and coffee. It was a huge success, and people love it so much. They started to have breakfast with this, not supper. And so it was a great revolution. And this is why, in the 50s and the 60s, of course, espresso and espresso machine became so popular in, the, in our country. And, and the coffee was, uh, for many Italians, the cheapest way of, of offering something to our friends. 
because it was very cheap. The coffee in Italy is still pretty cheap. If, if you step into a coffee shop in Italy, you don't spend more than one euro, maybe 1.2 euros for a, a cup of coffee. It's a very cheap price or two euros for a cappuccino that compared to the price that you have to pay in New York, it's zero, <laughs> of course, very cheap. But this is still part of uh, the beautiful story. I'm laughing because um, as you know, I rent an apartment in the province of Genoa, not in Genoa, but in a small town and have been going there for many years. It's the region adjacent to Piemonte and Torino. And I can get on a train and be in Torino in about two hours. And so often I've come up for the day and gone back. And the region is called Liguria, the Italian Riviera. And I love it. It's one of my favorite places. And I love the people. Uh, they're ingenious and creative. And the food is fantastic. And I have no complaints about the Ligurians. The Ligurians, however, are famous for being... Tirki, in other words, they don't spend their money. Very and <laughs> this comes back to the old tradition when they were it was maritime and poor. And I'm not criticizing, but they're famously frugal with their money. And in the rest of Italy, no matter if someone's economic status, when you go to a cafe, they say, offro io, no, offro io, let me pay, let me pay for the coffee. Um, I, in Liguria, have almost never had someone buy me a coffee in 45 years. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and I have a dear friend there. And for about 30 years, we'd go to a cafe and, and I would always say, oh, and he'd say, va bene, fine. And after about 30 years, his name was Massimo. We went into a cafe and I reached for the money and he said, no, no, let me, you you bought the last time, and I want to say I bought the last 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's a lovely thing when when I when listeners go to Italy and, and you offer it, it's a nice thing to offer. And at a certain point, you kind of decide who pays and you remember, and then the other person pays the next time. But it's part of the social interaction in Italy. And in Naples, there's something where you buy an extra coffee not for your friend, but for the next person who comes in who may not have enough money for a cup of coffee, which is a beautiful tradition that I love about Naples. Naples, great coffee city as well. Oh, yes. When we talk about the great coffee cities, it's right up there with Turin and Trieste and others. Um, I realize, and you're talking about when people want coffee all at the same time, I don't think I've ever told you something about my family background that's fundamental. Um, my family was from Russia and Ukraine, and that society is a tea drinking society. They drink chai and they live on it, basically, and it gets them through winters and revolutions and life can be very hard in Russia and Soviet Union. And my family came to the America in the 1890s, all of them, and most of them were terribly poor. One branch, though, my mother's father were samovar makers, samovar being the large urn that distributes tea. And you see them in Russian offices and hospitals and um, on a Russian train, you see them. And my grandfather was sent to America not to escape oppression, but because so many Russians had moved to New York that they wanted to expand the family business of selling samovars to Russians in New York. <clears throat> and he got here and he discovered in effect that when the Russians, many of them Jewish, got out of Russia, they said, fooey, we don't ever want to drink tea again. This is America. It's a coffee country. We're drinking coffee. So my grandfather could not sell his coffee, uh, his uh, samovars. Oh, my grandfather invented the coffee urn. He's the person who designed it. The first thing that brewed and distributed coffee with a, a tap that you would press down and the coffee would come out. And now they're all over the world. But it's what my family produced when they got to America. Then they produced other coffee making equipment and knives and kitchen equipment, all made of steel. But um, so I grew up with coffee because that smell that I told you about. My grandfather always had coffee. He would not touch tea either. I, I like tea. 
But um, so it's uh, the whole thing is a culture, the cups, the design. There are plays, Carlo Goldoni, the Venetian, wrote a wonderful play called La Bottega del Café. Um, it seems that coffee reaches everywhere when, when people sit down to meditate, when people sit down to discuss how to make the world better. They often do it over a cup of coffee, occasionally wine, but you get tired with the wine. Whereas with the coffee, it animates you just enough. I know that many composers and musicians, but especially composers, I mentioned Puccini drank a great deal of coffee and many of them do because it provides that inspiration. And if you go to Leipzig, um, Mendelssohn and Schumann and Brahms and Grieg was in Leipzig, drank great amounts of coffee there as part of their coffee circles. And in Germany, there is a, a wonderful coffee drinking tradition I think the brewing is not quite as good as Austria and certain other countries, but um, I like coffee in Germany as well. And, and the Netherlands, just everywhere, even England, which was way behind, it was the tea drinking nation now has an excellent coffee tradition. And I dare say, I think it's better than New York. It didn't used to be, but we've declined a bit in New York because you don't have to talk about this Giuseppe, but um, there's a very famous coffee company in America or coffee seller that claims to imitate the Italian tradition. But what they do with their coffee and the roasting is the flavor is so burnt that Americans who are were big in our emotions and our sensations. And we think that that burnt taste is better than what I consider the more subtle balanced taste that you find in coffees made in Italy, in Vienna, in Sweden, which is another wonderful coffee country. Um, and I, when I teach coffee here in the States, try to teach without naming brands, because I don't do that, try to teach the different sensations that one can get coffee. And then I say, do you like your bread burnt or do you like your bread toasted? Do you like... Uh, things to be intensely flavored or flavored so you can still smell it and appreciate it. And it requires that degree of sensitivity without being pretentious about it, that we apply to music, that there are people who claim to know everything about music and be the experts and so on. And I, I'm passionate and I know a fair amount, but it's really about the pleasure that we can find in these things and the insight and the meaning. Um, and with this, I'm pointing out that your company has been very active in the support of culture. And I think it's fair to say that in Italy, historically, because there were ruling families such as the Medici's, uh, the Gonzaga's, the Savoy, there was the Vatican, there were all kinds of these large institutions, they tended to pay for the arts, they tended to support the arts. Teatro Reggio means the Royal Theater. Um, many of the cities in Italy with their opera houses and their concert halls, uh, they were supported by ruling families. And therefore this concept of corporate support of the arts, when the ruling families went away, the government in Italy funded to some degree, a lot of the arts, but Italy has more visual arts, more culture. It has 40% of the world's patrimony of culture in one nation. And so for that reason, not everything can be uh, supported by the government, even, even if they want to. And I'm paying this as an admiring compliment to you, not as a friend, but as someone who works in the arts primarily more than coffee. Um, you've been a leader in business and corporate support of the arts as an individual, but also with your company. What prompted you to do that? Uh, I think in America has an incredible uh, mess in it as well. It's a country where the private sector, it's really supporting art uh, uh, across the board. And in Italy, of course, we had this tradition and we still have, of course, uh, but the government uh, play an incredible role in our cultural life. 
And sometimes uh, uh, the government uh, pretends uh, to have uh, full control of these uh, activities. And unfortunately, uh, of course, uh, nowadays uh, with the economical crisis uh, we are facing, not only uh, recently, but over the last uh, decades, uh, the private sector has gained uh, uh, a larger role in supporting uh, uh, cultural life, uh, arts, uh, and of course, uh, defense and, and keep the integrity of uh, the artistic assets that Italy has, has the great luck to, to have and to offer uh, to the world. Because of course, uh, it's not just uh, you know, an Italian heritage, it's something that belongs to the, I think, the history of humanity. And, and so uh, privates are more and more uh, involved, of course, uh, in backing arts, uh, in all the different aspects, uh, from the museum to, of course, for example, to uh, the events, uh, to uh, uh, music, uh, opera house, uh, orchestras. Uh, uh, and this is great. So the government also tried to uh, increase the participation of the private sector uh, in this direction, offering some, I could say, small benefits uh, to uh, create incentive to do that. And of course, everyone uh, is, is, is participating. And, and for us, uh, it's not just a social duty, it's a real pleasure uh, to offer our supports uh, to uh, keep intact the integrity of this incredible uh, heritage we have and we love so much. Uh, we are pretty involved, of course, for example, with many museums, but not only in Italy, if I uh, uh, can say, because, for example, we have a good partner with uh, the Guggenheim in New York, we have a good partner with uh, um, um, some important museum in Russia as well. Um, in St. Petersburg, for example, we have big partners with uh, the the Museum of San Pietroburgo and in many other countries in the world. The Hermitage. The Hermitage, yes. And we are, for example, supporting uh, uh, the uh, Egyptian Museum in Turin, that uh, it's one of the most important uh, uh, Egyptian museum in the world. It is the second after the Cairo. So if you have the chance to come to Turin, please uh, take time to visit the Egyptian Museum because it's something that it's very worthy. It's, it's totally renovated. And the director, the curator is a very good friend of mine uh, and of my sister is a great guy. And we, we, we created a lot of, uh, for example, uh, interconnection and collaboration with the Hermitage Museum. So the Hermitage also, for example, a beautiful exhibit coming from uh, uh, the Egyptian Museum in Turin. So we create also this kind of, uh, help to create this kind of international networking that's really helped quite a lot, uh, uh, of course, to, um, uh, to um, expose and to show public uh, and to the audience and international audience, the beautiful things that we have in our country. We are, for example, partnering with the Peggy Guggenheim Museum in Venice, with uh, the Municipal Museum in Venice as well. Uh, we like it. We are, of course, partnering with many uh, um, musical institution, around Italy with La Scala, with the radio, with many orchestras. And uh, so it's, it's part of our DNA, I can say. It's part of uh, 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 mm, uh, the responsibility that the company and the family wanted to, uh, uh, to pick up and at the same time to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to back. Uh, it's part of uh, our uh, way of uh, uh, thinking about uh, our uh, our job as entrepreneur we know that uh, we have to do that because uh, we want to be uh, active uh, active player in our society not just a company that it's there of course to uh, uh, make profits uh, or to uh, present a, a beautiful uh, top line every year uh, better than the year before but we know that as a company, we have to play a different role and we are here to uh, sustain what's a very important represent the heritage uh, for uh, the next generation. So 
Mexico. We well, will. I, as someone who knows Italy very well, will say that what you're doing is unusual even now. It's becoming more common, but in the past, you would see banks that would underwrite the publication of beautiful books that would be given out to wealthy people. But it was not necessarily a benefit for the masses to um, see an exhibition that the bank may have produced a book, a commemorative book about. You would see the fashion houses of Milan, of uh, the Missoni of Trieste and um, Florence and other places underwrite certain exhibitions, but especially relating to style, to fashion and so on. In Austria, you see a lot more, and Switzerland, a lot more corporate uh, support for the performing arts. And where Lavazza really, frankly, has distinguished itself in the Italian context is your support of the performing arts, because the performing arts are evanescent, evanescente, in that they're on a stage for two or three hours and then they're gone. They can be recreated, but it's not like building an exhibition and putting paintings there and having an exhibition run for four months. And the, with the painting, you already know what you have. Whereas if you're supporting a new work of music or the touring of an orchestra that's playing uh, music by composers such as Casella, who is well known locally, but not necessarily a well-known composer, what you, your company is supporting is something more risky because it's not a known quantity. It's not like showing the Sindone, the Shroud of Turin, um, and everyone knows what that is and what to expect. How do you feel about the risk factor of supporting performing arts as opposed to, I mean, you, yes, you support visual arts a lot, I know that, but you support performing arts and in the Italian context, that is unusual. My, my personal belief uh, and uh, my perspective is that uh, uh, art uh, is, is so significant because uh, it's able to talk to you on a spiritual level. And uh, performing arts uh, are, uh, are so uh, straightforward in doing that. So uh, you are totally involved. Uh, and uh, uh, when you like, uh, um, when you like, for example, to attend a, to a performance uh, and you feel the uh, excellence of the execution and you are totally involved uh, in, uh, in, uh, in what is going on on the stage, uh, I think this is uh, something, you know, really spiritual. It's able to, to carry you from uh, a physical state uh, to a spiritual one. And uh, it's a thrill. It's really something that uh, uh, is so, you know, deep. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an incredible sensation. I think that the pleasure uh, to give this chance to many people like-minded, that are not, of course, uh, uh, maybe rich or poor, because it's something that belongs to everyone that likes this kind of uh, incredible experience. It's really providing uh, an experience. Uh, and for a company as Lavazza, providing experience, uh, it's our mission. And of course, we can do that uh, very humbly, uh, providing you a good cup of coffee, where we try to put inside all our passion, our heritage, our vision, our hopes in the same time, our projects, our dreams, everything. In the same time with the performing arts, it, it's part of this, it's just a different way of looking to a, a, a similar feeling and experience. And it, it's such a pleasure to offer you something nice. I think it's very connected to this idea of offering you the best of us. And we are doing that with a coffee. Of course, it's very, you know, individual. I mean, of course, we, our interpretation of coffee, it's the Lavat's interpretation of coffee. And of course, we try to uh, be inclusive, not, of course, uh, repulsive. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. We want to be nice, not we, we want to offer you a very welcoming way of, of entering or enjoying 
the experience of a good cup of coffee, but this feeling of offering you something special, it's exactly, I think, the same attitude what you can find in our way of selecting, for example, uh, our, our partnership when we're talking about arts, performing arts, so, you know, so deep, so intense, so beautiful. So why not to try to offer to a larger audience uh, the chance of being uh, involved and totally overwhelmed by uh, this, this, uh, this beautiful feeling. And, and maybe, of course, uh, on the other side, why not to try to help a big institution as important museum uh, to uh, uh, play the parts uh, in our social life on a daily basis. And again, is something for everyone. I think another very good lesson we can take out from coffee is that coffee is a great pleasure, could be aspirational if you want, at least, but is an affordable luxury and is for everyone. And the coffee has the ability to adapt itself to uh, your special needs. We, we were talking about the fact that coffee is, of course, a, a global product, is a global consumption, but at the same time, it's very local. And you mentioned many examples of that when you said, okay, in Russia, for example, people like tea. Yes, and now in Russia, people like, of course, they started drinking coffee using a lot of instant. It was the best uh, and uh, easier way to pass from tea to, of course, to, to coffee because the kettle is there that the hot water is there and it's simple to prepare uh, this kind of coffee. But nowadays, uh, Russian too are uh, much more interested in enjoying that real coffee. So they are shifting towards uh, a, a different level of experience. In America it was the same. People uh, were pretty familiar with, uh, uh, you know, drip coffee and, and the regular American coffee that now more and more uh, people are, uh, are uh, intrigued by the specialty coffee and the different way of preparing coffee, the espresso machine, milks, uh, different blending and recipes. Uh, so it's a big evolution. The coffee has this capability uh, to be flexible and, and really to follow people uh, in, a, in a, the evolution of uh, the daily life. And at the same time, it's to become friends of everyone without losing its own identity. This is so beautiful. And the, the, uh, and the mission of Lavazza in, in providing coffee is really to try to, of course, uh, embrace uh, the humanity, <laughs> offering, of course, a lot of different kind of coffees uh, and try to be, you know, not difficult in terms of understanding the coffee and the different coffee culture to, uh, co uh, so to customer coming from uh, every part of the world. But at the same time, we need to keep our identity, not to, be, to dilute our uh, Italian DNA the way as the family and uh, our people want to interpret uh, um, the coffee consumption in the arts at the same time. So we are very selective. We like to join some specific uh, uh, arts instead of others because it's a matter of choice. But uh, the way we want to offer you this experience is the same as we like to offer you our best cup of coffee with a smile and put it inside all our sour fare or our you know, way of saying, okay, Fred, you are uh, welcome, please. Uh, we want to enjoy, to share the pleasure of the coffee. We want to share the pleasure of enjoying this uh, piece of art. We want to share the pleasure of, of attending this beautiful performance uh, and we love it and we know they are doing a very good a very good thing. You referred to something that I wanted to bring up earlier and I'm going to get back to it's the coffee topic again. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I understood that Lavazza does roasting and blending that is slightly different for different countries. And so what I mean is I once bought a, I believe it was a Crema e Gusto. You have a line of coffees and one of them is called Crema e Gusto, which probably has Robusta in it and flavor. Um, I bought a package in Italy and I bought a package in France because I was working in France. 
And I traveled from Italy with my package of coffee and bought another one in France. It didn't taste quite the same. I'm not saying one was bad, but I've noticed that Lavazza coffees in different countries and even Southern Italy tastes a little different than it does in Torino. Is, am I mistaken? Uh, the Creme Gusto you mentioned is a range. So there are a lot of, uh, it, it's a range made, uh, made up with different products. Uh, all the products are called uh, Creme Gusto, but uh, we have different blends. So, uh, but the same product is the same in every country. We don't change it. So we have a portfolio of different products uh, uh, in particular because we want to have different flavors, but everyone uh, is, is, is the same and we don't want to change it. Uh, where, uh, the, the reason why we are so uh, focused on blending is exactly because we want to keep consistent your coffee uh, over the time. So when we know that you like this kind of blend, uh, all our efforts uh, are focused on giving you exactly the same feeling and the same flavor, despite, of course, a lot of uh, uh, elements can change uh, in terms of the quality of the raw material. So we try to, you know, to make up for you the same bouquet every time, if you like, for example, this kind of products. Different from the origins, the origin is exactly the opposite. When you, uh, you, for example, define, accept, I know what you mean by origin, but define for a listener what you mean by yeah. origin coffee. Uh, origin is not a blend. For example, a blend uh, as a, uh, as, uh, Fred mentioned before, could be a sort of uh, composition of different coffee coming from different countries. In the legendary 50 beans, uh, you have a coffee coming from different countries. And the purpose of the blend is to keep the flavor exactly, to replicate cup by cup the same flavor without changing. And this is a big job because we are not working with, uh, of course, uh, uh, something that doesn't change uh, is a natural product. So the agricultural cycle changes the taste of coffee every year. And we, we have to work very hard uh, to, uh, to recreate, uh, maybe using different kind of coffee, the same taste. So that, uh, the, the goal is the taste. And when we're talking about origin, we are talking about uh, just one kind of coffee, for example, uh, a coffee coming from the Kaffa region in Ethiopia, maybe coming from a wild coffee forest. Uh, so it's a natural coffee, not treated, uh, organic by definition, of course. Um, and this is a single origin. So it's not a blend of different coffee coming from different countries, but it's just one single origin. And the single origin, of course, uh, is a single origin. So uh, it can change over the year because uh, uh, the purpose is just to give you the uh, opportunity to taste the coffee coming from this specific piece of land. And uh, the, the variability uh, and the volatility of the taste is part of the game. But uh, it's, it's the only way we have to give you the chance to experiment it and to enjoy a very specific type of coffee. And we are, when we are working with origin, we normally uh, uh, are working with a very high and excellent uh, coffee in terms of quality. Uh, so we just work with uh, the best of the best of the best, uh, because we know that uh, uh, using this kind of coffee, the variability is limited. So the risk to have big fluctuation uh, uh, um, is smaller, uh, and in the same time, the exceptionality of, uh, of this coffee really um, give you the chance of uh, experimenting and enjoying something so special that it is, it, it, it's, it's, a, uh, uh, it's a pleasure for a company at Lavazza to, to provide you this kind of experience. For example, uh, uh, you were talking about uh, the Yemen as one of the country where coffee started to develop uh, across uh, across the continents, across Europe and Asia. And nowadays in our portfolio, we have the chance of offering you a special coffee coming from Yemen. Uh, it's a country devastated by the war. Uh, it's an incredible um, 
social situation and, and, and having the chance of, of sourcing this kind of coffee from a very tiny and small coffee community in Yemen it is exceptional coffee. Absolutely fantastic. We call it Opera Prima. So just to, to highlight how this coffee is, but this is a single origin available in a very, very low quantity. But it, it, you know, the storytelling and, and the people around this production and, and the social situation of the country, it, it's so compelling. It, it's a great pleasure to offer to our audience of coffee, the coffee lovers. Uh, this I like how you say your coffee audience. It really is like performing arts. I'm going to give the listener a parallel to think about to what you're talking about with Origin Coffee. Where I live in Liguria, the olive oil is delicious. And what's unusual about it is that most olive oils in the world are blends of different olives. Some of them are fatty, some are peppery, some are sharp, some are round. And they create, when you blend them, a complex olive oil. We in Liguria have what's called Tajasca, Taja, T-A-G-G-I-A. It is just one olive variety. And we use 100% Tajasca. That's like having a Yemen coffee because it is unique to what it is, to its place and to its origin, and it cannot be replicated elsewhere. <clears throat> Another way to think about it is if you imagine a Bordeaux, Bordeaux wine is a blend of Cabernet Sauvignon, of Cabernet Franc, of Merlot. It may have a couple of other little reds in there. Uh, Tuscan wine, Chianti Classico, is a blend of Sangiovese. It may have Cabernet, it may have Canaiolo. It usually has five different grapes in it. And those are blends. If you only drank, my favorite of the Tuscan blend is Chile Giolo which uh -huh. is a little cherry berry kind of thing. And it gives a wonderful distinctive note. I like drinking 100% Chilia Jolo. I like having 100% Tajasca oil. I like, I love basic Lavazza, as you well know, but I'm fascinated by the origin coffees because they are unique expressions of one place rather than the blends that you make that are for popular taste. And, uh, it's very interesting to support these. And I'm saying you as a company supporting them because what you're doing is maintaining heritage and biodiversity. And this leads me to a very important topic. Um, you know, Giuseppe, that I don't drive a car. I made a choice a long time ago to be very green, very environmental. We used to call it ecology. Um, I do as little to pollute the earth as possible and always have. And I, I choose products that tend to be mindful of the environment. Uh, one of your colleague companies, Illy, is very, very mindful about the environment. And I'm very happy to support them. And they also support visual arts. Um, so I tend to pick companies that support the environment and the arts when I choose their products, if the products are good, like yours and Illy and a few others. And because Lavazza being the largest coffee company is dealing in such a large way with uh, communities in Brazil and Colombia and elsewhere, where it, the quality of life, of education, of healthcare relates to the quality of the coffee. Your company, Illy, and a few others have been leaders in changing the social framework of those communities in other countries. Would you talk about that? Yeah, uh, we are very involved uh, in many uh, sustainable uh, uh, um, program in all around the world. We started many years ago uh, in uh, 2004 uh, with our foundation uh, uh, named uh, um, Giuseppe Pericle Lavazza Foundation, uh, two guys of uh, the second generation. And through this foundation, we provide a lot of supports uh, to our coffee communities uh, and really running a lot of projects uh, in, uh, in many, many countries and helping uh, around 130,000 uh, small, all the farmers uh, all around the, the globe. 
So we are very active in Central America, in South America, in West Africa, in, in Asia as well. And of course, um, we started many years ago trying to help especially um, the coffee community to improve the productivity and, and to make it true out of this kind of system they live in and improving uh, the livelihood of the small of the farmers, introducing best agricultural practices, introducing new practices to announce, uh, especially the productivity, it can help, of course, the farmers uh, to live much, much better. Uh, but uh, here, uh, at the beginning was, uh, uh, I can say, a pretty um, individual action done by the company throughout the foundation. But as you know, uh, the international agenda, especially in terms of uh, of, of of goals, uh, uh, became uh, more and more global. And um, uh, for example, of course, uh, with the launch of uh, um, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, and the United Nations 2030 Agenda, all these topics uh, became more and more relevant uh, for us. And, and so we introduce in our um, uh, sustainable action uh, a lot of new challenge connected to, of course, uh, the climate change, uh, the gender equality, the social inclusion, uh, the better work conditions, uh, respect of the soil and the water, protection of the environment, uh, and, and, and improvement of the social and economic condition of uh, the local community. So the agenda became uh, 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 broader and, and of course more complex. At the same time, we created a lot of uh, cooperation and collaboration with many other companies, traders, uh, internet NGOs, organization, uh, international institution. So this is a very relevant part of our uh, our responsible um, uh, activity towards uh, uh, the coffee community, but we open uh, many new uh, new uh, paths as well. For example, in Colombia, I will mention this because this is an incredible um, uh, example of, uh, of of uh, of a program we run in Colombia, uh, putting together a lot of different stakeholders: the Lavazza Foundation, some Colombian NGOs. The Colombian government uh, during uh, the period of time President Santos uh, was was in charge, uh, Microsoft Colombia, and 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 some uh, traders uh, uh, active in Colombia as a part of so big team uh, of of different players, and we set up um, a project uh, uh, with the aim of uh, uh, carrying uh, the Wi-Fi connection and Wi-Fi signals to remote rural areas uh, and providing through this uh, uh, um, technology innovation, uh, more opportunity for uh, the coffee communities. Uh, starting, for example, from uh, collecting a lot of data with uh, sensors and helping so the farmers uh, to better manage their farms. Uh, for example, in terms of uh, irrigation, uh, using or fertilizing or uh, using uh, different techniques uh, to mitigate, for example, the climate change uh, or uh, some other very important diseases, the rust uh, that affect uh, in a significant way the production of coffee. Or for example, just trying to provide better service to the, to, to the community, for example, uh, mm, the telemedicine services, so providing some uh, medical services uh, uh, that were provided by a very important uh, medical university based uh, in, uh, in, um, in, um, in Antioquia, uh, in, in Colombia. Uh, the university was connected with the local community through this system. And of course, uh, uh, the doctors in the place can, uh, can, can share some, some uh, some information and the same test and diagnosis uh, with, with the doctor staying hundreds and hundreds of kilometer, kilometers away in, in, in Antioquia. Or for example, providing some supports to the local school for education and, and even providing uh, training people to use digital devices. And the system was provided by Microsoft 
what's called a, a wet space uh, system of connecting. Uh, is a system that used the uh, analogic part of, 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 uh, of, of the space uh, to provide uh, this internet signal. In the same time with the government that provide us the access of as free space uh, to, uh, to uh, connect uh, uh, without cost uh, the rural community with this system. And this was an incredible innovation, really provide a lot of benefits. And now this model is replicated in many other areas in Colombia was something very innovative. And this demonstrate the force of the collaboration. At the same time, uh, the importance of try to be, uh, you know, um, um, visual in, in terms of, uh, of, 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 of designing and drawing this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, international program and, and sustainable program as well. So uh, for us uh, is absolutely, relevant because the company is totally depending from just one commodity, this is coffee. So we need to have a very wealthy and, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, strong supply chain. People in the field uh, have to be happy to, uh, to, to, to work in, in coffee, to being a coffee farmer. We need to uh, cope with an incredible a very important uh, problem related to the generational transaction because many farmers nowadays are pretty old and we need to attract the young generation to keep on uh, the business alive, otherwise we are dead. At the same time, as you mentioned, biodiversity, so important. Uh, we are a company, we can work uh, uh, with just two colors, white and black. We need a huge array of different colors and so we need to have a huge array of different kind of coffee to of course create our blends, to be creative, to be creative, and to support the local community, to offer you this incredible experience of the single origin. So we need biodiversity. It's really very relevant and paramount for us. And of course, all the problem related to um, the coffee climate uh, and of course uh, the immigration, for example, think about for example, being weak uh, in, in, in the agribusiness uh, and the remote area in terms of uh, uh, opportunities uh, means to create a lot of people that like to immigrate from uh, the, re the, the, the rural area towards the city and maybe towards other states. So the implication that we have when we are looking at global industry as coffee uh, are, are incredible. And we have the, of course, uh, we, we, we have to act very fast, uh, seriously, responsibly, team, uh, um, created a, a very nice network, uh, team working with many other stakeholders to try to avoid, of course, the risk of lose everything. I, in fact, was going to discuss immigration with you. You anticipated my point, but I'm going to use the example of where I live, the United States. We have a border with Mexico, which has a border with Central America. Two small countries, Nicaragua, I'm sorry, Guatemala and Honduras, are outstanding coffee producers, not in mass quantities, but great quality. And I know that um, they are devastated with violence and all kinds of really terrible problems. But Lavazza and a couple of other companies have invested in that. And what it means is if people stay on the land and they can earn a living, uh, they don't have to migrate for economic or other reasons. The problem, unfortunately, is that often people who are working honestly and working hard are threatened with violence or blackmail or other things for their income. So it's, a, it's a, quite a struggle. I know that. Um, you know, part of the pleasure every week of doing these programs with individuals such as you is that it requires me to do reading and research ahead of time. And I read Italian, so I went back and found some sources in Italian about your company, but especially Luigi Lavazza, the founder. And he went to Brazil in 1934 with other importers of coffee uh, to visit the plantations. And he wrote after a world that destroys the goods of nature is one I do not belong in. And I thought that was so modern and so ahead of his time that he recognized even then the environmental and social and cultural issues 
involved in the product coffee that he was working with. So was that philosophy passed down through the generations? He was the first generation, you were the fourth. I imagine that it's been part of your company's approach, if not activist. You're a lot more activist than perhaps Luigi was, but it was a different world then. Um, but did you grow up with this in the family, this belief? Uh, uh, we took, uh, 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 I think, uh, a big lesson from this uh, experience our great-grandfather had when he, for the first time, uh, traveled to Brazil. Uh, he dreamed to travel to Brazil, he was invited uh, with a few Italians uh, to participate to this mission to Brazil. And was so excited when, uh, of course, uh, he stepped on the boat uh, uh, and, and, and took the journey towards Brazil. But when he, he came back, he was, he was devastated by what he saw. There was the people destroying the coffee, burning the coffee because it was an overproduction of coffee. So impossible to sell the coffee. People just use the coffee in this way. And and for uh, for my great grandfather, this was, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of uh, I don't know, something unbelievable. He can't, he can't really believe that something like that can happen. The man can do that. I think that we took from this incredible episode of his life uh, the sense of respect. Respect, I think, is the base of, of all the action we take as entrepreneurs and at the same time is the, the pillar value we have in the company and we want to share with other with our our peers with our associates all around the world so the sense of respect is the source of everything the source the sense of respect towards uh, of course what nature provides to you people working uh, on on the producing countries and try to do their best to to produce the coffee how we can try to help them to uh, have a, a, a better, a, a be, to, to make a better living, to earn a better living and to have better uh, uh, social condition as well, because it's not just the quantity of money you have, uh, but you know, uh, the, the social environment you live and the, and the kind of, uh, of opportunity you offer to the next generation uh, the gen, for example, the gender equality is it's very, and the gender inclusion is very important in those countries. We see when we are able to include women, for example, in 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 the in in, in the strategical decision, maybe of the family around the business, the production, uh, the financial. At the same time, uh, the you know. Um, uh, Everything is, is it, it, it's better, it's transforming in a better way. So it's absolutely uh, valuable to have this kind of, 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 of support. And, and for example, at the same time, so respecting people, respect towards the environment, respect towards uh, the product itself, respect towards the customers, respect towards our associates, respect towards our land, uh, our our. Uh, our, um, yeah, um, for example, our city, our region, uh, we uh, were involved in this incredible pandemic crisis. Everyone, of course, we suffered quite a lot, but uh, we wanted really to give our apps to, uh, uh, to the people uh, in, in our region and our country that are fighting uh, and trying uh, uh, to uh, to look after many others. So really we want to be uh, one active player and respect, really respect is the key word for us. And when you show respect, I think, uh, uh, you know, the level of reading you have on every kind of uh, possible issue is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the right one. And you can start, of course, to provide a lot of supports but if you have respect, uh, your sensitivity is just uh, at the right level to start to thinking how to act and then really to provide uh, uh, an incredible support uh, long term, not just, you know, uh, for the short term and not just because you want, you know, to, to loan to maybe something that is not working, 
but because you trust in this kind of uh, of of uh, um, of of, um, of feature. In the same time, you know that people that are working with you are very sensitive to that. To that, it's a way of motivating your people, of, of giving them the chance of saying, "We are working for a company that is not just a company. It's uh, it's something that is." Uh, uh, something of our way of seeing how the words could be and, and want to participate actively uh, to um, the program that the company is is carrying over and is supporting because we understand that we can really do uh, something relevant to change not completely of course but a little bit uh, for better the world that is beautifully expressed I'm going to close just with a couple of other things, one of them a secret and the other one something I meant to bring up earlier. When I moved to Italy to live in 1975, I lived in Bologna, and Bologna is a magnificent food city, and it has its own coffee brand, Segafredo, and I didn't really know Lavazza and Italy and Kimbo and all these other brands from around the country, House Brand, which I came to love a lot. Um, and I knew Segafredo, but in the supermarkets and stores of Bologna, they would have all these other Italian brands. The way that I first heard of Lavazza was because your company was very ahead of the curve in terms of advertising and communications. And in terms of advertising being not only informational, but entertaining and you later on engaged the actor Nino Manfredi, who was a presence. Luciano Pavarotti did a commercial, as I recall. And, but it was more about the emotion that was communicated in this advertising than about the figures. And, you know, sometimes they'd be sitting on clouds, floating on a cloud and drinking a coffee. And you could just understand the serenity. This to me was interesting. Italy had at the time something called Carosello, I don't know if they still do, in which after you'd watch a whole program with no commercial interruption, then you'd have maybe seven or eight minutes of beautifully manufactured and directed ads by Fellini, by great film directors. And among these were the Lavazza ads. And they caught my eye and my attention for that. So it was then that I went in Bologna and bought a package, not of Segafredo, which was everywhere, but of Lavazza, and that led me to other coffee brands. Talk about the visual arts communications. We spoke earlier about your support of the arts, but the creation of art for a coffee company, the design of packaging, the materials, everything with Lavazza and some of your competitors, has a beautiful feeling and emotion surrounding the actual coffee. Talk about that. Yeah, uh, but I think that's a the respect that we put in many things. Uh, it's always the key to interpret uh, in, in the right way also uh, how we decided to uh, communicate uh, the brand and of course the, 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 the portfolio, the, the product portfolio of, of the company. And uh, uh, it's more or less the same. I mean, uh, so advertising sometimes it's pretty boring and uh, it's a sort of, uh, you know, you interact uh, in sometimes in a very rude way with the audience. Uh, um, uh, you stop, for example, the favorite program or, uh, or TV show years ago uh, of, of the audience and then you force them you know, to... Uh, uh, to listen to or to watch to your commercial. And, and sometimes uh, you try really to highlight all the feature of the products uh, and more or less is the same story. So you don't have any identity, any uh, specific way of uh, interact with, with, with the audience. And so we decided to change uh, all these uh, this, this standard way, you know, normally marketing impose you to do uh, advertising in uh, following uh, specific schemes. But we decided to, again, to, to, to open a, a different way, a different door and to go through this, this path. 
So not to launch in the face of uh, the consumers, uh, of the audience, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the magical feature of your products, but at the same time, but, but created a, a, a sort of a, a, a entertaining, uh, entertaining, uh, entertainment uh, a break where uh, the idea was to uh, uh, to uh, um, speak to, 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 to the audience uh, in a very nice way and offering a small show uh, where at the end they can laugh, they can, uh, uh, you know, have a really uh, a break of uh, real entertainment and not just uh, a commercial. So it was much more a little show uh, uh, with the idea of give you a, a, a moment of pleasure and so to be accepted, you know, uh, in, in a different way than just, uh, you know, launching on your face uh, the brand, the products, uh, the characteristic of we are selling uh, the, the, the new products or uh, the convenience or what you want. No was a different kind of dialogue, uh, a different conversation we wanted to set up uh, with, with the audience. Uh, and, and, and in Italy, it was very popular to, to use comedians to do that because people like, like this kind of show where they can laugh, they can have fun, they can enjoy you know, this, 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 small, this small piece of theater at the end of... of, of uh, it was. Really think about our commercial as a small piece of theater where we want really to give you the chance of having fun with us and to laugh and to have, uh, you know, uh, an entertainment uh, uh, instead of uh, a, a, sim a simple commercial. And this was the way we started to build our advertising uh, way of communicating uh, the brand and the products to the audience, really with this sense of respect and interaction that is not the straightforward just you know, to sell you the products. They were very distinct. And I, I, as you know, I was studying theater and opera production and performing arts. So, I, and I didn't know who Nino Manfredi was. So it's not that I thought, oh, it's Nino Manfredi, the famous actor, but just the mood, the feeling, and yes, as you describe it as theater. And it was very, dis they still are. And it's interesting that that model begun more than 40 years ago is basically still your model if you're advertising in your image, which make other people have copied it, but not quite in the same way. It's kind of like revisiting an old friend when you see a Lavazza commercial, because the emotions that are, and not because I know you, but because the commercials are such that they evoke a feeling more than hard sell of a product. So Giuseppe, just a couple of things. Uh, we have a mutual friend who will be joining me in June. Um, he's a wonderful musician. We didn't talk too much about the Teatro Reggio of Torino and the Philharmonic of the Teatro Reggio of Torino because I'm saving that for June. But I just wanted to tell you a secret that I've never told anyone. Um, I make very good coffee and I make what is called Plotkin Blend. And Plotkin Blend is its own special blend. It is... 40% Lavazza Oro, and that's the largest single amount. But then there are four other elements in there that I don't tell to anyone. I'll make it for you sometime. But um, it is coffees from elsewhere, and not just Italy. And the combination of this Plotkin blend is very, people love it. And, but I've not patented it yet, so it's just going to stay what it is. But I do want you to know that the foundational coffee, the 40%, the majority is Lavazza Oro. Ah, and I want so, to try it. I want to try it. Next time I come to New York, you, really you are obliged. <laughs> you must prepare. Me. It's really good. And it's measured in Locked 10 in cups. Blend. It's measured in 10 cups because um, tablespoons, there are four tablespoons of Lavazza Oro. And then the other elements come in in different measurements. And it's the way that they are combined because 
Um, literally the first one is the Lavazza Auto and then everything comes on top of it and I combine those four, but I leave the Lavazza Auto un untouched. I don't mix it with the others. And um, that's what I'm drinking today is Plotkin. So you are uh, my competitor. No, I'm not. I, I've <laughs> been buying this stuff for 45 years. <laughs> and it's a pleasure. And, and uh, it's been a pleasure also developing a friendship with you well after I became someone who used your product. And as I said at the beginning, I'm not doing a commercial today for your company. I don't have to, and I don't, I don't do that. But I wanted people to understand what is behind this product, but also to understand the many connections between coffee and the arts in terms of our sensory perception and everything that goes into creating a cup of coffee is similar to everything that goes into creating a piece of music or a performance. And I thank you very much for all that you do. And it was wonderful to visit with you today. I do hope one day this pandemic will allow us to see one another for a cup of coffee in a concert. And in the meantime, thank you. Thank you, Fred. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I love our conversation. I really hope to see you soon in New York. I miss, I miss traveling. I miss New York. I miss America. I miss all my friends in New York and all around the world. I feel myself in cage. Okay, coffee connect us, of course, but having a coffee together is not like having a coffee on a Zoom platform, a team platform. This is different. And coffee is a drink of peace. And we need to enjoy the coffee sitting one in front of another and talking and having laugh and, and just, uh, you know, enjoying uh, the pleasure of uh, our company and stay together. This well, is there's just one problem with your plan. When you come here to New York, I'll be in Italy. <laughs> oh, I, I, oh, no, no, no. I want to. No, no, no. If you come to Italy, I promise you. I pledge I'll stay you in for, Italy. I'm okay. here waiting for you. <laughs> And then where you are in New York, I come to New York. So we Perfect. can I'll make you plot. Yeah, 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 yeah. To match our plan in the, in the best way. Very good. Take care and Take go care have a too. cup of coffee now. Thank you. So I much. know it's the evening, but it's good in the evening.